Hey coaches, my name is Alex Carrick. I am the ABAX coach at St. Ignatius College Prep in Chicago and the founder of the Flexbone 101 YouTube channel. And today uh, was invited on to talk a little bit about one of my favorite plays, uh, hopefully one of your favorite plays if you're a Flexbone coach, and that's midline. Uh, so before we hop in too far into midline, um, just to give you a little bit of background on me as to why you should watch this and not just think I'm some scrub from the internet. Uh, so I have primarily coached in the Midwest. Uh, this it will be my eighth year, eighth season, uh, once we eventually have our season in the state of Illinois. Um, I am originally from Rochester, Michigan, uh, and I played as a player on the offensive and defensive line at Stony Creek High School in Rochester, Michigan. Uh, that would be home of first overall draft, first round, first overall draft pick Eric Fisher for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I even added a nice photo of me from high school where you can see the golden locks. It was the early 2000s. Anyone that was alive at that point will understand. Um, also, I'm still kind of jealous because now my hair is going a nice shade of gray, which my players love to tell me daily. Uh, after that, uh, I attended the University of Michigan, um, not playing football. Players sometimes like to ask me like if I played in college and it's like, no, I went to school for academics. I'm also like 5'11 on a good day. And at that point was like 175 pounds. So no one really recruited me to play on the line. From there, uh, coached at Madison West High School, uh, one of the largest high schools in the state. I uh, was there for five years, started as a freshman offensive and defensive line coach, uh, worked my way up as a coordinator, became the freshman head coach, and then a varsity special teams coordinator, excuse yes, varsity special teams coordinator. Uh, and for the last two seasons and going into my third, uh, I'm the varsity ABAX coach at St. Ignatius College Prep, and we run a very true flexbone offense. The other reason you might know me is the Flexbone 101 YouTube channel uh, that I launched in June 2015, really as a way for me to learn the offense. Uh, I had a head coach who came to Madison West who ran a option version uh, of the offense, and I didn't know a lot about it. So I started breaking down Georgia Tech games, Navy games, Army games, uh, more for me to try to learn the offense. Uh, and then put them on YouTube because I figured other people might enjoy watching them as well. Um, and I still love doing them every week. Uh, I always pick up wrinkles, like to see how, how they do in different situations. Uh, moved on to some more uh, fundamental content on different plays, different uh, blocking schemes, doing some question and answers. Uh, have been working into getting into more live streaming and building that community. Uh, and really just want it to be a, a resource for Flexbone coaches or any coach in general, really. So if you have time, check it out. I'll plug it again at the end. Uh, and honestly, it's, it's nice enough to be able to do things like this, uh, really just be kind of a, a Flexbone evangelist uh, for anyone who will listen. So on to the show, talking about midline. Uh, so midline, for those of you that do not know, in a nutshell, uh, is a quick hitting double option play with the quarterback and the B-back. It allows you to leave a defensive lineman unblocked, uh, especially in our league where we play a lot of very big, very talented, some with D1 talent, D linemen. Um, it's nice to not have to block them. And then finally, it can be run with equal success between uh, even in odd fronts, uh, there are some obviously wrinkles that you can do from one to the other, uh, but you're never in a bad situation if the defense is going to throw something you're not expecting at you. So what this looks like. So we have our center and our quarterback uh, under center. I typically run this offense from under center. I know some people like to do it from the pistol. I would say if you're in pistol, it doesn't hit quite as fast. So there are some other variations that you can do on this. But the basic idea of the midline is the B-back is going to run on the midline, which straight up the center, uh, your center is going to have to move. They're going to read the action key, which is the player that's not being read. 
and your VBAC is going to find the hole. When that happens, there is one D lineman who we are not blocking. That D lineman has to do something. Uh, if he comes down and tries to tackle the B-back, which is what football players tend to do, the quarterback is going to pull the ball and run through the gap that the D lineman vacates. So it's very simple and very deadly, um, especially if you have a quarterback that has a little bit of speed. Um, it's not required, but the idea is with one less lineman that you have to block, that's one more block that you can pick up in the defensive secondary to spring it for a big play. The basic rule for the quarterback, right? He's going to, if whether you do point method, whether you do a full mesh, uh, is that the quarterback is always going to hand off the ball to the B back unless that read comes to make the tackle at which point he's going to pull the ball into his belt buckle and get around the player. So first things first is quarterback footwork. So because the B-back is running straight to where the quarterback is going to be, quarterback needs to get out of the way. Um, so sometimes this is a quick two steps out of what we call the square, uh, where the, the quarterback stance is normally. Uh, this is also... Um, a time I'm going to thank my head coach, Matt Miller, uh, for me being able to creatively use some of our practice film and some of his terminology and some of the things he's written up. Um, so thank you, Matt. Um, also, because that means I didn't have to redo everything myself. So quarterback footwork out of the square where he is under center. He's got to move his feet because the B-back is going to replace his body. So you'll see here that our quarterback will take two steps uh, get out of the way and put the ball right down the line of where he is trying to go. Here we go. And straight through. That's also a great drill. Uh, if you are a flex bone coach, right? Just working on practicing the mesh, practice making the read. Uh, you can do this for midline. You can do it for triple. You can do it for anything. And then obviously rotate them around to get your quarterback used to what this looks like. Cause you might see a lot of different looks. In game, what this looks like, I've got two quick screenshots, uh, one right before the snap, one right after the snap. And I'll show you where some of these, what this play looks like later. Um, but notice that we have the quarterback getting completely out of the way of the B-back. B-back is going to replace. He winds up then following his blocks. If the read winds up coming down to tackle the quarterback, then he's going to pull it and go. From quarterback footwork, let's work to offensive line rules. What I love about this play, what I love about the Flexbone offense is that all of our plays are rule driven. Uh, so we see a lot of, uh, you know, defense of the week is the nice way to call it. Um, you might call them junk defenses. Um, there are probably more vulgar names for them, but in general, if we can create rules that our linemen can know, memorize, love, then no matter what front, no matter what situation we get thrown at us, uh, we're going to be able to block it. And we're going to be able to have a successful play. Um, so we're not burning timeouts. We're not getting large losses. We feel confident in everything that we're going to do. So first things first, I'll work on the play side. Uh, play side tackle is we want to fan block the second man outside the center. Um, the reason it's the second man is the first man is getting red, so he's not going to be touched. Um, so a lot of times in an even front, this is going to be a defensive end. In an odd front, a lot of times this becomes an outside backer, um, and that block becomes very important. Play side guard is going to veer release uh, to the inside and typically pick up an inside backer. There are a few situations where that rule has some caveats, uh, a big one would be against an eagle where it's there's a nose guard over the center and the play side guard is covered where you really want to get a good double or a good chip on the nose guard uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later center is really easy um, if you have a nose guard or you're covered you block him um, if you don't block down help out the the backside guard and then the backside tackle is really there to hinge and protect the B gap, make sure there's no one blitzing, make sure there's no run through. 
really making sure that because if someone knifes in that angle, um, the mesh happens really close behind the line of scrimmage, and you need to make sure to not have a lot of quick penetration, especially on the quarterback's blind side. So we've talked about our read. Uh, our read here is that we are going to read anything that is a 2i or greater. Um, 2i, uh, if we need a refresher on our defensive line techniques, a 2 is going to be head up on our guard. A 2i is an inside shade, so that's right about where my dotted line is. We will read anything beyond that. So if he is in a one technique or a shade, we're not going to read him. We're going to move on to the next guy. If he is in a 2i, we will still run our midline. A lot of times for us, it's an auto pull that we know that the B back basically is gonna act as a lead blocker in that case because it's so tight, um, we live with it. You know, there are some situations where that's different, but that's primarily what it is. Now, what this looks like, I'll run you through a few different defensive fronts just to give you an idea. Um, I have denoted the read in gold so that it pops out so you can see exactly who I'm talking about. You'll also notice in this that we have a play side backer in almost every defense that is also unaccounted for at the moment. Uh, that's because I'm going to run you through the A-back separately. And they're the ones that are going to pick that guy up. So don't, uh, don't get too upset by that at the moment. So this in a 4-4 stack, I don't know about the rest of the country. Uh, we saw a lot of 4-4 last year, probably 70 plus percent. Again, my coach Matt Miller could give you the exact percentage, um, but much higher than normal. So that's why I started here. We're able to get a fan on the tackle to the outside. Guard is going to veer to inside, inside backside, inside backer. I have this drawn as a double here. It's the most important block on the entire play. Um, if you have just a dude at center that can man that guy up, great. You could send this guard straight to the backer. Um, otherwise, we can commit to that double and a guy can ship off if necessary. And then backside hinge here. Against a 3-4. Uh, this is one of those situations that I noted that if you have an odd front, that first man for the play side tackle, or that second man outside, I should say, is a, a backer. So we need to be athletic. He needs to take a good angle. He needs to rip through the, the read to make sure that he can make that block. Um, and he's protecting the inside out. Guard's going to come down. If this nose guard winds up shooting this A-gap hard, guard can obviously chip and help out on his way to the backside backer since he's got support. Backside guard's going to go through to the backside backer. Backside tackle's going to hinge. 4-3, very similar to the 4-4. Um, actually, almost identical. Oh, actually, it probably helps if I were to actually change the backers. So my apologies for that. Let's fix this on the fly, which is the fun part. So we'd have a backer like here. We'd have another backer here. He'd be kicked out a little bit and he'd be kicked out a little bit. And we'll uh, kill those. All right, so with our three, first guy to the outside here, there's our first block. This guy who's gonna be the backer in the center, our Mike is gonna be who our guard is going to go towards. We've got our center here is going to get the shade or the one technique or the backside tackle. If he needs help here, like I said, that can still happen. Otherwise getting this guy to the backside backer is gonna be your best bet. From here, going to three, three, five. Now I have to second guess myself and make sure I have this done right. <clears throat> Again, out of an odd front, our play side tackle going outside. Basically here with play side guard and the center, uh, it's a two for two. So however we can best navigate these two, the better. Um, if this backer were to blitz back down this way, uh, you know, it probably makes sense to have a call for your offensive line so that the center knows he has to come out and help with that. 
otherwise, uh, as long as these two on two are handled, then the guard can go to the backer and then backside tackle hinges. Against an Eagle eight, uh, this is a defense that we see a lot on teams that want to really stop our inside run. Uh, this is difficult, but not impossible to run midline against. Uh, what I do recommend, and I, I note this a little bit later, is if you are against an Eagle front, see how much you can cheat out your offensive line splits. Because what that does is that brings that read a little bit further and gives you some more natural creases to run through. Because uh, a lot of times when teams run an Eagle, they really just want to create a log jam in the middle. So the more space you can provide, the better. And all of our rules here, again, I haven't changed the rules on the right hand side. All these rules remain consistent. Um, and as long as we can get bodies to where they need to be, the midline read also in this defense, you'll see we have a nice alley here, assuming we get everything else blocked. And I'll show you how we're going to block that play set backer in a second. So a backs, a backs are, um, my passion. They're what I coach. There's a lot of intricacy to what we can do with both a backs to influence the defense. So there are multiple tags that we can have to denote who's going in motion, who's blocking, how they're blocking, who they're blocking. We can influence the defense's reads to put our players into the best position to succeed. And we can make this play of midline look like triple. So it's going to look like every other play we're running and we can make it look like triple in the direction we're going. And we can also make it look like triple going the opposite direction. So first things first, really easy. This might be your base call. Um, I generally recommend having one call that when you call midline, your players know that's what they need to do. Um, however, this could be it. It could be any of the other ones, but this is the most basic of an insert. Um, I have that listed as no mo, which is just no motion. Um, so you can run this on a silent count. You can run it on a quick count. You don't have to worry about motion, um, especially if you have a defense that's keying on your motion, um, you can run it without it. So our play side A-back is going to insert. Remember that this tackle is going outside and fanning. So the A-back is gonna come right underneath. Typically, I like him to stay low. I want him flat backed. I want him to attack with the shoulder and just charge his shoulder and keep driving his feet through the linebacker when he makes contact. Um, sometimes it gets a little messy. Worst comes to worst, if he hits that Reed who's standing here, um, then the play just becomes a give. And we have this guy sprinting in two pitch relationship because what midline also does is it leads itself to mid triple. Um, so that's going to help you set up for that. Um, and when to run, if you notice that you have a defense that is triggering uh, motion, triggering their defensive backs to roll to your motion, that's when you would run something without motion. From there, we have a regular insert. However, what this is gonna do is cause the backside A back to be in motion. So this play is going to look like triple right, and then we're going to run midline right. I guess I should have preface that all of these are going to the right. Uh, and then we still have our insert at the snap of the ball going through the B gap. We want to run this when teams are overplaying triple. Whoop, there we go. That's why I hit my mouse wheel. Uh, when teams are overplaying triple, we're hoping we can hit them inside while their eyes are going out to the alley uh, and run, run, run right underneath them because they'll be expecting the quarterback to keep rolling on triple. Uh, and instead we can get him going vertical. Next, we have a twirl insert. Um, in our lingo, we would call this a con insert. That we're gonna make it look like triple going to the left with the A back going in motion. He gets two feet into the ground on his motion and is then gonna turn straight up and become a lead blocker through the hole. So it's the same block as the other insert. He's just doing it from about two yards back and two yards in. And what this does is, especially as it gets the defense looking the opposite direction, you can usually get 
the defense frozen for a second or two for you to be able to get in good position. Another attack is blast. Um, if you have really strong blocking a backs, if maybe you need a little extra help, um, if you just want to bring everyone to the party, uh, you can run blast and run both of your a backs through the hole. Um, you can still do insert on your play side and on your backside, making this look like triple. He puts a foot in the ground and turns straight up and run, blocks the next guy inside. So this can be good or bad. Uh, so it's good if the team is really thinking triple, if they're worried about the outside, um, if their safeties might be cheated to one side. Where this doesn't become a benefit is if they're keying your a backs, and that's really just going to trigger another linebacker or safety to come fill the hole and make it more of a log jam. So you're kind of, you need to test to see how the defense is going to react to that type of tag. Next, we have replace. Replace is a fun one. So our play side A is actually going to arc release as if he's running triple. We run this specifically when the outside backers are keying the A backs. So instead of folding him in and bringing this linebacker with him, when he sees him roll in, he might trigger down. If we know he's going to stay with our A back, then we're just going to send him out on an arc and have him float out with him. Then what we do is we have the backside A back who's in motion, come up and insert as if he were the other A back. So it's really playing games with the two of them, who's in motion, what direction they're in motion, who's making the block. So we always have an extra man for that play side backer that was unaccounted for by the offensive line. And then it's just a matter of how we can manipulate the defense to get in the position we want them to be. Putting it all together, it looks like this. I again drew it up against a 4-4 four because four, that's what we've been seeing the most. Um, and I think it kind of just is really easy to demonstrate that I have this drawn up as a, you know, con insert a back in motion before the snap. I realize I also use dotted lines for both motion and what might happen on the read. So don't get too confused on that. I hope it's not, but leading through, he'll be able to get that backer. The idea is that the handoff to the B back is going to be so fast and so quick, this backer is not going to be able to make that play very easily. But if he does, we usually tell our A back he's trying to block for quarterback. So we want him outside in trying to push him that way. Most of the time it winds up just being hitting him head on, making sure his head is on this side of the backer and driving the legs through because we really only need about a second, maybe a second and a half of standing him straight up to clear a hole for either the B-back or the quarterback. Anything beyond that is gravy. Uh, little coaching point on that, if you can get him, and by him I mean the play side A-back coming through, to stay low, have a flat back, hit with that shoulder. I always recommend to my players using that little like chicken wing technique, literally just almost keeping your forearm out and tight to your body because first is it's going to make it so the court the linebacker can't run through his block it gives that extra point of contact if you have a kid that's a little bit of a enforcer um i'll watch my language uh you you can get some force up into that defender to get him on his heels a little bit um, and it also makes it so they don't hold him because uh, AVAX have a tendency to want to reach out and grab. And the last thing you want on a good midline is a hold from the AVAC. So really keeping it tight, keeping a fist and allowing that surface to be an extra impediment to the linebacker. So this is all well and good drawn up. Um, I will show you one video of what this looks like. Uh, this is from last year. This is us playing against Joliet Catholic, uh, home of Mike Allstott, for any other NFL early 2000s nerds like myself. 
what you'll see here is we have our read. This is going to be midline to the right. We are going to con our play side A back and come through the hole. And then our backside A back is going to just run into pitch relationship. What you'll see here, notice that this guy is in a three. <clears throat> He's going to come down. This safety is so drawn in. I, I should mention, I believe this is also the first play of the game. It's at least the first series. Everyone thing is going to get so sucked into the middle on the original mesh that the quarterback is going to, spoiler alert, run free. So everyone clears out of the middle. The safety falls for the mesh. The play side linebacker falls for the mesh. Our A back actually winds up, if you watch, blocks the corner, who's the only man there. And able to spring him and keep going. I also like making fun of our quarterback because he basically trips over his own feet because he got tired. Sorry, Leo. I'm going to make fun of you for that always. But that's the power of midline uh, because teams need to decide what you're going to take away. And once they make that decision, you make them pay for it. Um, in this case, we had a very fast quarterback. We also had a great B-back. So they took the B-back, they overcommitted on the B-back, and it opened up a huge seam that we were able to exploit. Now, we didn't wind up winning that game, but we looked really good on that play. So some coaching points when it comes to midline. You cannot get penetration from a nose guard. That mesh happens immediately behind the center. So if your center is going backwards, he's going to bump into your quarterback and bump into your B back and bad things happen when that's the case. Um, it might be a drop snap. It might be a fumbled mesh. It might just be a tackle in the backfield, but none of those things are good. So that's why you really need to focus on if there is a nose guard and if he is a good nose guard, or maybe your center is not a superstar committing to that double team or figuring out what you need to do between a, a double team and ship something to not allow that penetration. Second coaching point, if the read gets blocked, it becomes an auto give, right? Then you're just man on man. It should, everyone should still be blocked. Everything should be great. It may not be a perfect play, but at least the ball comes out. Um, I mentioned this earlier. We do have a two eye uh, for us as an auto pull. Uh, that's just because he's really close to the mesh and chances are he might be tackling the B-back as that mesh is happening. So we put that in so that there's not a bad B-back quarterback exchange. When he sees a two eye, he's calling a two eye. So B-back knows he's going to point the ball just enough so that the read is going to tackle the B-back and he knows he's pulling it back in and is going to loop around. And the big thing um, I was asked recently, what one of my favorite plays in this offense is, is mid triple. Um, if you run midline effectively, mid triple also becomes an awesome play to run. The last coaching point that I mentioned earlier uh, that I didn't create a bullet for is really, you can control the defense with your splits, um, especially if you're against an Eagle front where things are getting really compact um, if at any point, and this is flex bone in general, but also for midline, if you feel like things are really condensed in the middle, make sure your linemen have good splits. You know, you would say three feet. I might tell your kids four or five feet, hoping that, you know, when they're tired in the middle of the game, that they actually get to three feet. Um, Cause that's going to create those natural running lanes that if they're really tight are going to be really hard to run through. So some tips versus even fronts. The reason it's against even fronts is an odd front is really easy. You generally know who the read is going to be, and he's going to be either a three or greater typically. So there's going to be a nice wide gap for you to call your midline through. But also, they're usually 
symmetrical, right? Where, where the left D end is and where the right D end is and odd front are going to be the same. In an even front, you typically have to worry about the D tackle, right? Because we want to run this to an A gap bubble, which means there's no one there. Um, a lot of times in an even front defense, you've got one D tackle and a three and one in a one. You want to run it to a three. You do not want to run midline to a one. If they are in a one, you would rather run triple. <clears throat> so some tips. This is why I love this offense, because we can dictate what the defense is going to do. So the first is know how the defense is calling their strength. They have to know they're calling it based on something. Um, a lot of teams are going to do that to the field or to the boundary. Uh, the boundary being the short side of the field, the field being the wide side of the field. They're calling it to the field. That means that you're typically the three technique is going to be to the field. The one technique is going to be to the boundary. Use that to your advantage and call the play to where you know the D tackle is going to be. However, as anyone who's ever called a game knows, nothing is ever right 100% of the time. So give your quarterback an audible to flip the play. It should be really easy if you have midline right called here like I have drawn up, and you're like, hey, midline right, the guy's in a two eye, or we'll say the guy's in a one. Don't want to run it there. I want to run it to the left. You know, you might want to run like check out, call it check over, call it Riverside, call it tomato, whatever you want it to be called. There should be a call for your entire offense to know, hey, we called midline right. We're running it to the left because that's where it's going to be successful. Um, the cousin to this is if you want to keep things going to the right, maybe you have a, an athlete you're trying to get the ball to. Uh, Maybe it's not switching from midline right to midline left. Maybe it's changing the play from midline right to triple right. Um, that way things are still going the same direction. Your personnel is still the same, um, but puts you in a better position to call the right play. Last tip is we can use different formations to force the defense to shift. Uh, if you've watched Navy this season, they've been doing this a lot. You can play games with an unbalanced front because most defenses are going to shift their entire defense over to an unbalanced front. So then that one technique now becomes a three technique and is much easier to midline. So that can be used in conjunction with the first bullet point of knowing how they're calling their defenses because you can run your unbalanced line into the boundary and put the defense in a really bad spot. And what that also does is open up a lot of really long runs and a lot of cutbacks, a lot of plays to the short side when the defense has to overcommit to defend all the gaps in your unbalanced formation. So I think that's everything. That was a great uh, overview of midline. Um, I cannot I don't know. It's one of my favorite plays to run. It should be in every Flexbone coach's toolbox. I think, you know, even if you're not a Flexbone coach, there's a lot of ways that you can implement a similar play, similar framework on being able to run to a, uh, you know, read one defensive lineman and make your call based on that. So I hope you've learned a little bit about midline today. Again, uh, my name is Coach Alex Carrick. Uh, you can reach me at coachacarrick at gmail.com. Find me on Twitter. Find me on YouTube. Find me on Twitch. Um, I am around. Uh, in the meantime, with COVID, um, I've actually been having coaches reach out to me saying like, hey, coach, can you, can you watch our film? Or like, what would you do against this? Uh, and because I'm not coaching, uh, I've really been looking forward to that. Still feel really connected. Uh, to coaches, always happy to help with any resources I have. I'm willing to give my time to anyone who wants it. Uh, yeah, so if any type of question you have, any resources, uh, if you just want to bounce ideas off, happy to do that. Uh, if you have your own podcast or video, happy to uh, be a guest as well. And uh, I guess.
guess that's all I have for you today. Best of luck this season, coaches, and feel free to reach out if you need anything.